and hard chrome because that's a standard practice and that any manufacturer does and did. So uh, there's, a, and there's a few other things that um, that they probably ended, you know, they, they ended up doing that uh, I'm not aware of. But like I said, it's been five years in California being reworked. The Stifton, once they got their airplanes, they started talking to the guys in California. They started comparing notes, and they found out that the list is even longer than either one of them thought. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time? We're out of time. Well, if you give me, if you guys will give me about five to ten minutes, we'll go through the Oscars real quick. Okay. Sorry, I took so long. Let's uh, blame that one on me and, and my mouth. Doug Champlin was originally offered um, four zero airframes that were discarded by the Japanese on the Krill Islands. This is the very northernmost island of the Krill. If you spit across the channel, you're spitting on on Siberia, at the Kamchatka Peninsula. Doug took a look at the pictures and said, "Those aren't zeros, but it'll take them anyhow." Turned out that they were KI-43 Oscars flown by the Japanese uh, by the 54th Sensei located up there during the war. Um, he brought them on over, and the story that he brought them over is, is pretty interesting in itself. Um, had to deal with Russian government and a lot of uh, additional back pockets being filled. He finally got, it, he finally got to his place in, in Scottsdale, and so when we start, so when it hit the fan for us, Doug graciously, you know, said, okay, hey, guys, work on these. So we did. We recovered, you know, and after, um, we found out the Japanese made things much more difficult than the Germans did, or even the Americans did. These things, uh, you know, why build it in one part when they can do it in three parts? So our part count went up tremendously. Uh, but you can see here we have uh, one of the fuselages together. We've got our wings coming together compared to what we had to start with there. Uh, cockpit view, uh, actually before the seat went in, uh, the, the Oscar did have what's called a butterfly flap. Butterfly flap. That's located. That's on that uh, that unpainted part there, on the the far for the far lower picture there. Uh, those things were actually able to be deployed anywhere in flat in flight, not just on landing. Don Lopez, who flew for the what the 23rd Fighter Group, who took over after Chenault, tells stories about he had Oscars lined up. And sure enough, they, they deploy that flap, and they're gone as such. And he still finds his P-40 trying to figure out how to get around. Um, you know, the original engine was a Sente, uh, Sente which uh, was the, the Navy version of the same engine, went, on to the, uh, went into the Zeros, the same, same engine went into these as such. So, you know, if you, if you don't know what you're looking at, you'll say it's a Zero, but it's actually an Oscar flown by the Army. This thing cannot land on a carrier. Uh, again. Everything you're seeing there is basically you know, uh, our doing here. Landing gear, again, uh, we built everything there but the, but the rubber. That, we, that actually came off a nose. Uh, that tire is actually the nose tire from an F-86. Only place it's ever used. A quick shot here of, uh, of our first airframe, you know, getting ready for, for first flight. Uh, we've got a couple more fuselages over there, right? and you can see our, next, our, our wings coming together over there. Um, yeah, this here's where Buck really came in handy. He was our uh, our uh, our round engine specialist, so he him he really came in handy, you know, making the making the engine systems work right as such. There's Wes Sanders in the cockpit doing an engine run. Uh, maybe we need to send Wes a picture of this. And okay, another view, another giant view here. Um, we did have some, we did have some issues with our landing gear on on the Oscars. Uh, turned out that the trunnion shaft, what we thought was welded to the uh, to the upper upper strut, weren't. They were uh, one piece forgings, and so we did have some issues with that. We uh, we, we collapsed the gear one time due to that. <coughs> As such, not much fun when that happens. Um, you know that that particular airframe that you see there, that's actually uh, in Tillamook, which I think they recently relocated. But uh, Eric, Jack Erickson, that's his airplane. Uh, another one who's finished out as a static airplane is now in Seattle Museum of Flight. And uh, let's see here, the other two I think are again in Jerry Yagan's backyard. Eventually, he wants to do something with it. Doug Champlin. Uh, when he sold his collection, he started 
offloading all his air, uh, air, airframe responsibilities, and Jerry made him an offer, and he decided, let's just go ahead and get, get him out of the way. So, so Jerry's got those last two, and I don't know what his plans are for, for finishing them out. But once our first, once we got our, our, once we did our part on the airframe and, and as such, we got to a point where um, Doug was having his issues, we were having our issues. It was best to go ahead and just shut down the shop. And with that, uh, in June of 2005, which is 10 years ago, we uh, we closed the doors. Okay, uh, just a footnote here. Back two years ago, uh, the Collins Foundation, like I said, they took over the judges' airplane. Uh, they had they were flying it out of Houston, and they're going to some air show in Oklahoma City. But they, and I can give you another lecture on on drag issues. But uh, they had to stop here at Meacham Airport for uh, for refueling. We heard about it, so I grabbed Herb and we went out there to see it and got this picture of him in front of the airplane. So I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Okay. <laughs> And I didn't get around to tell, tell my, my, my P-12 story here. Okay, while well, he's coming.